So my name is Terry Kylo. I'm a, I grew up uh, in Eastern Washington State uh, on the land of the Palouse peoples. Uh, I grew up uh, in Christian white supremacy. Not the kind that is gathering at the Grange Hall, right? But the kind of white supremacy that, that says that white people are more important than other people, especially white Christians and especially white Christian men, right? And so when I would go to Sunday school, I would, you know, sing a little song, you know, Jesus loves the little children, all the children of the world, right? And then I'd go out to the parking lot and I'd hear another message. I won't repeat those messages here. But they really stung my heart when I heard those messages out there in the parking lot. And yet I was still raised in it, right? So five or six years ago, I began to get to know some American Muslims and I began to realize how much hatred was being ginned up against them by hate groups that spend 30 to $40 million a year to poison other American citizens against our American Muslim neighbors. And as a Lutheran Christian, I knew that I had uh, some learning to do because my Lutheran friends in Germany in the 1930s and 40s had not done what they needed to do either by knowing their Jewish neighbor, standing up for their Jewish neighbor, or being willing to risk themselves for their Jewish neighbor. And being a part of that tradition, like I knew when I saw a similar process happening against our American Muslim neighbors, that, it, that I had to do something as a Lutheran Christian. And so about this time, five years ago, I resigned my call uh, serving a couple of churches, one Episcopal and one Lutheran, and began to work to counter anti-Muslim bigotry full time. So when I would go out and do speeches with American Muslims, right, um, I would get up there and do my, do my best. But I always had a batting average. And not only did I have a batting average, I also still had a lot of anti-Muslim bigotry inside of me. Because it's been programmed into me since I was a little kid. And so um, after I got through doing speeches, you know, I would take my, my Muslim partner aside at some point, uh, sometimes we do it on the phone and the cars on the way home because we did speeches all over Washington State. And I would say, how did I disadvantage you today? And sometimes their answer was, was painful for me. And sometimes I would lose sleep because I realized that either by some attitude or some word I used or by my physical uh, gestures or the way I was on the stage with my partner, that I had in fact expressed a kind of a subtle white supremacy in that space. And I had to go back and do some serious work on myself and try to do better next time. And of course, the beautiful thing was that my American Muslim neighbors kept inviting me to work with them, right? Because they had the largeness of heart. They had the compassion and the understanding to continue to work with me, knowing that I was not a perfect person. So I, I, I won't lie to you, like this last five years has been tough. And of course, I put it that way, listening to Diana's words, the last 400 years have been tough and the last 600 years have been tough. But this last five or six years, you know, has been, has been tougher for me because I've become more aware of the, of the supremacy that was uh, put into me and the supremacy that's all around us. And I've been encouraged by the folk here in Langley standing up and standing together and quit not being passive and afraid as white militia groups began to invade your community and take over the Grange and begin to bully people. I just want you to know that I've been so thankful for the work that you all have been doing and people all over the state know about what you're doing and people all over the world know about what you're doing here. And part of what I want to remind, so give yourselves a round of applause. How about that? Part of why we gather today, though, is to celebrate the parts of the 4th of July that we can celebrate, right? Um, and that's a difficult, nuanced conversation. And if I say something that offends you, please come up and talk to me afterward, right? But what I think was happening in 1776 was an attempt to take a step on a journey out of supremacy and into something else. Unfortunately, it didn't go all the way or nearly far enough. It was just one little tiny step. It was a step away from the supremacy 
of one monarch named George and starting to form a government of, for, and by the people. Of course, the problem is that the people at that time had a difficult time recognizing people. Who didn't they recognize as people? Say it. Native Americans. Native Americans. Who else? Blacks. Blacks. Who else? Women. Women. Who else? People who weren't white, but they even didn't recognize whites as humans sometimes either too, right? Amish, Amish poor, people. poor people, Mormons, that was later, but yes, Catholics, LGBTQIA+, women. So they took a step away from supremacy, and we can acknowledge that that step was uh, was okay. Like part of it was we can honor on the 4th of July. They, they took a step along a path though toward we the people working for a more perfect union for liberty and justice for all. They took a little teeny step along there. Now our, our militia friends, they want to claim that they are somehow the inheritors of that step, that they are the inheritors of that little step along that path, that little journey toward liberty and justice for everyone. They want to claim that they're it by claiming that their very title, the three percenters, makes them the true inheritors of the Revolutionary War because only they say falsely that three percent of people participated in, in, that, uh, in the military in the Revolutionary War. But I think they fundamentally misunderstand the small step toward liberty and justice for all that was taken on 1776, July 4th. They misunderstand it and they misrepresent it and they claim it for themselves. And they really do a disservice to all the people who listen to them because they are fundamentally misunderstanding this journey that we're on. What I've learned in the last five years doing the work to counter anti-Muslim bigotry is that there is so much more work to be done. And yet, I have seen so many people doing the work, not only here in Langley, but in Snohomish. Three, three mothers got together and recognized the racial bigotry in their school and began to meet together and began to have public events and began to have conversations with people. A folk in Anacortes, a year and a, two years ago now, had a noose hung in town and people came together and asked the city council to make a resolution about that noose and to stand up against hate crime. As the Black Lives Matter protests began in Anacortes, some young people in the community who were former uh, residents and former uh, graduates of, of uh, Anacortes got together and they stood up on the street corners advocating for every that every life matters and that black lives matter and that indigenous lives matter and that LGBTQ rights matter. But at that moment, it was important to stand up for black lives matter. And we you know what happened to them? They got threats. There were people who pushed them and who shoved them and screamed at them. And still they came back and stood on the corner. In Wilmer, Minnesota, of all places, there was an idea that a mosque would come into that town, right? And a whole bunch of people with guns showed up at the city council meeting. And you know what they were trying to do? Intimidate the council into voting no on that mosque. But a young Lutheran woman and a young Muslim woman who went to school together and who loved each other and saw the human being in each other led a whole bunch of other people to come. And they went to that city hall meeting and they gave the city council the courage and the passion, and the conviction to vote yes on the mosque. Yeah. That is the path that we're on. We the people, working for a more perfect union with liberty and justice for all. And that's why this last year has been hard for me. I've been feeling a lot of grief and a lot of anger and a lot of, you know, even some despair this last year. Because we know that, uh, that some of the forces in this country that don't share that same vision are gathering strength and trying to bully people and trying to keep people silent. But it was people like you that helped me find the courage to continue to move. So we the people, we have to remember that many of those under the sway of the hate groups, of the militias, um, 
they they are they get hooked by that and i've learned this by working with so many people that come at me angry about things that they think american muslims believe or do they get hooked by it by something that they love and the militia groups work on that thing that they love but they work on that thing that they love and say that thing is being is being threatened and they misrepresent what the threat really is uh, people out there who are under the sway of these groups forget that the that the founders actually put right in there um, to work for a more perfect union which means that you have to be able if you're going to work for a more perfect union, you need to look at how it's imperfect right now that's about learning that's about growth that's about recognizing how people who have come before us no matter what community we are no matter what tradition we're part of or not we have to be able to look at what our parents did and our grandparents did what people in our country do currently in terms of policies and institutional ways of living that do that fall short of liberty and justice for all and say no and make a change. So the people under the sway of these groups are being taught that we cannot learn from past mistakes. When I was in seventh grade, my dad sat me down in his chair, his lazy boy chair, and I knew it was never good when he sat me down in his chair. <laughs> And he told me, Terry, you are not working hard enough on your school right now. And your teacher said that you're getting C's and something needs to change. He didn't call for change in my life because he hates me. He calls and change. He called for change in my life because he loved me. People who are part of different groups in this country, like all of you, are not calling for change in this country because you hate it. You're calling for change because you love it, because you're willing to learn and change and move. But the folk that are part of being influenced by some of these these hate groups are told that learning is bad that learning is wrong that to learn that our founders held slaves and did not see the rights and the ownership of the land by the indigenous people and so many other ways that they misunderstood who we the people are is somehow to disgrace them it is not to disgrace them it's to carry forward a vision that they took a half a step on Lastly, we got to work as a country for liberty and justice for everyone. Having understood that human beings are come in diverse shapes and sizes and capacities and cultures and skin colors and heights and, and every other kind of diversity in human beings, beginning to recognize people as human, we can begin to work for liberty and justice for every single person. So at so many of the speeches, as I come to an end here, what I've said to people is that we're in danger right now in this country of getting to the point where we are so anxious and so angry with each other that we're going to forget how to recognize other human beings as human. And when we forget how to do that, we don't just harm the other human beings around us. We've also done harm to ourselves because part of the supremacy that we need to overcome is the notion that we need any kind of supremacy at all. That we don't have to rank ourselves by pecking orders and who's more important and who's less important. But what would happen if we really lived into the idea that all human beings are created equal in the, in the image of God or by the universe, depending on your point of view, and that they have certain inalienable rights? What would happen if we recognize that our true identity is just that we're human, not, not how we compare to somebody else? And I think that's what the militia groups are really afraid of because they're seeing across this country and in groups like this some capacity for us to believe for a moment that we do not have to live by a pecking order anymore. We do not have to live by supremacy anymore. We just don't have to live like that. And they are seeing as we march along this path, as we the people for a more perfect union with liberty and justice for all, they're seeing perhaps over the corner or around the bend, there will be a society in which we do not have to be more important than anybody else in order to have the beautiful identity of being a human being. And so I wanna thank you. It's been a tough week for me. I've been depressed this week, but I've been, I've been buoyed this week by the thought of all of you. The thought of people in Anacortes and Snohomish and Bellingham and Wilmer, Minnesota, and all across this country who, like you, 
have decided to get off the sidelines and to step up and stand together for everyone's humanity, despite the fact that some people want to tear us apart. The key difference between societies that move down a path of autocracy and the lack of democracy is this, that people move off the sidelines into the streets, move away, move away from being at home and alone and coming together and stand up and lift up a vision that all of us are human and that all of us can take our energy and our life and our humor and our art and our music and our organizational capacity and find meaning in our lives by this, by remembering that we the people, in order to form a more perfect union, can work for liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Amen.